Okay, guys, let's talk about gas exchange disorders, airway and obstructive pulmonary disorders. Let's see if I can do this without screwing it up too bad. Okay, so asthma. We've all heard about asthma, right? Chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways. So the inflammatory mediators, which is the histamine, is released, followed by activation of inflammatory cells, which produce endothelial damage, mucus, and edema, leading to airway narrowing, typically reversible, right? So what happens? Somebody, the person with the asthma starts having an asthma attack. Next thing you know, they're unable to breathe, right? And they often have an inhaler that goes in and decreases the inflammation and they're able to breathe. Narrowed airways limit airflow, increases work for the breathe, of the breathing, trapped air mixes with inhaled air, impairing gas exchange. Okay. So over 18 million adults and 7 million children are diagnosed with it. A lot of times you'll have, you'll hear, and there's probably a couple of you guys in this class today, that has had, has, bleh, had asthma when they were younger, but they kind of like grew out of it. And that happens, it seems to happen a lot. I don't think many people are diagnosed quite as much in their later years as having asthma. Um, like you don't get into adulthood and then boop, all of a sudden you have asthma. Okay. But a lot of times it seems like kids grow out of it. Um, we generally don't see asthma patients on our floor. On, in the hospital because what happens is they come into the hospital they come into the hospital with an asthma attack they treat them down in the ER and then they treat them basically is what they do uh, what was I going to say I don't know um, strong genetic component environmental factors so environmental factors can trigger it it could be stress it can be the pollen in the air it could be a smell like a smoking um, perfume can cause an asthma attack oh, and there we go allergens respiratory tract infection exercise although my daughter was in, uh was diagnosed with how did they put it extra diet exercise induced asthma I don't think so. To me, if you're running and you get out of breath, that's called exercise. Okay. But I do believe that some people do when they're exercised, they, they have the inflammatory response and the histamines start working over time. And next thing you know, boom, you're in an asthma attack. She just got out of breath. Okay, so inhaled air, irritants, emotional upset, secondhand smokes, smoke, some medications, food additives, and GERD. Okay, chest tightness, cough, dyspnea, wheezing. And that's usually what we hear. We hear the, <gasps> that kind of thing. Tachypnea, tachycardia, anxiety, um, use of the accessory and intercostal reaction muscles, retractions, not reactions. Um, symptoms may be erupt or insidious, may subside quickly or last for hours or days. Um, generally, we'll get through it. We'll talk about it. Um, but marked reduction in breath sounds with reduced wheezing and ineffective cough may be the onset of respiratory failure. So what that's saying is just because they're not, you don't hear them wheezing as loud. Because at first you'll hear them wheezing really loud. Um... And you'll see the dyspnea, you know, but if all of a sudden you start listening to them and you don't hear the wheezing as loud, you really have to listen to the lung sounds because what could be happening is they're going to respiratory failure. Okay. They're not exchanging the air in their lungs. So you'd be hearing very diminished, um, breath sounds. Don't confuse that with them getting better. Okay. One of three most common causes of chronic cough is a cough variant, asthma, cough initiated by upper airway irritants, different than a cough associated with regular asthma, and that patient has cough only without this man wheezing. So they have the cough, but they don't have the the hard, they, it doesn't take a whole lot for them to breathe, and they don't have the wheezing, okay? But they still have um, inflammation of the airway. Okay, 
complications. Staticus asthmaticus is a severe prolonged asthma attack not responding to routine treatments. These are the people that we really need to get intubated. So they come into the ER and they have an asthma attack and we can't, we, 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 whatever we are doing, we cannot stop it. Okay. That's when they turn around and they um, intubate those people before we lose them. Okay. Um, other complications, dehydration, respiratory infection, atelectasis, pneumothorax, or core pulmonale. Okay, let's try this again. It got totally out of control. Okay, so lung function per PFT values tells us about your asthma severity. Um, we're going to where it shows the asthma severity, and do you need to know this? What do you think? Do you think you have to memorize this chart? Yeah, no. But just to be aware that there is a classification of severity. Um, if you look, the symptoms... Do they happen less than two days a week, more than two days a week? Are they daily, throughout the day? How many times do you wake up? How many times have you used that rescue inhaler? Okay. Um, interference with normal activity and lung function. So how do we diagnose? We're going to use PFT tests. Okay. X-rays doesn't show anything. Okay. They, you can do an X-ray. You can do a CT scan. And that's not going to show us anything about asthma. That's not diagnosing it. It's a PFT, which is a pulmonary function test. That's the same test that we take or we give if somebody's going through a, medical, a major surgery because we want to see how well they're going to be coming off that vent, you know, with a major surgery. Um, so we'll perform PFT tests to diagnose the asthma. If you're continuously having problems and you're using a rescue inhaler, then we'll probably do another PFT test to see if your lungs are getting better or worse. Okay. Um, we wouldn't necessarily do an ABG on you until you're in the hospital and you're having the asthma attack because we want to know exactly where your values are, right? We want to see where your pH is and what we can do to hopefully combat that. And then we're going to do some allergy skin testing. What what would um, trigger your allergy or your asthma attack? Okay, that's what we're going to test for. Okay. Now the peak expiratory flow monitor. What it is? It's a use of a. It's a little monitor that they breathe into in the morning, and it shows them how their asthma is doing that day. So green is 80 to 100 percent of personal best under control. That means you're good to go. Okay, you can do whatever you want. Well, within reason. Yellow, excuse me, 58% caution, may need further medication or treatment. So, you know, you don't want to walk away too far from your um, inhaler because what will happen? You might have an attack and you might not have your inhaler. Okay. And red, 50% or less, immediate need for bronchodilator and medical treatment. Okay. Red is the bad zone. So you need to do something now. Okay, because your lungs are not, it, they're not doing the job. Okay, prevention, triggers, stress, control dust, remove carpets, mattress and pillow, air, air filtering system, uh, pet control, tobacco, cold air. Do you ever see those people that walk around whenever it's cold out and they have masks? Perfect example. Early treatment of respiratory infections. These, these people should get their flu and pneumonia vaccine. Okay, because... Having the flu or pneumonia is not going to, it's just going to be a downward spiral for them. So we got to make sure they're treated. Um, also, some of the other things that could trigger uh, the roach poop, you know, um, that's, that's another thing we have to look into. You know, any kind of glue in the home, things like that can, can trigger that. Medication. Depending on the severity of the disease, um, quick acting relief prompt, okay, quick relief provide prompt relief of symptoms during ac acute bronchoconstriction. So this is when you're out walking and you see a huge deal at Kohl's, could be a Black Friday deal, and you can get a pair of, I don't know, boots that are normally $180, they're on sale for 10 bucks. Right, you're stressed out because you want to knock some people out to get those boots. 
Okay, so that would be a time where you use your short, your short acting bronchodilator. Okay, um, long term control is taken daily. Okay, so you're going to take it every day, no matter what, how you're feeling, how you're not feeling, you're going to be taking that daily. And what we want to do is have that long acting um, therapeutic response with that. Okay. Okay, so short acting beta antagonist agonist for quick relief up to three times in 20 minute intervals. So you don't do, it's kind of like, think about it in um, your nitro. You can do it three times, but it's 20 minutes instead of five minutes, okay? Or we could use a single nebulizer treatment as needed. Um, usually when those folks come in and they're in an asthma attacks, that's what we give them as a nebulizer treatment. Okay, then we're gonna look at long-term control for the patient, okay? Especially if they're using a short-acting bronchodilator, bronchodilator more than twice a week. Oral steroids from more moderate to severe exasperations per asthma and action plan. That's going to be like our one of our last dip, ditch efforts because we don't want anybody to have be on steroids for multiple years. Okay, we're going to get them the best we can get them without having to depend on those steroids. Okay, methods of administration: they're the meter dose inhaler. Okay, you shake the canister, exhale slowly and completely. Then you place the mouthpiece in and you inhale. Okay, and you hold it for 10 seconds and then you exhale. Then you wait 20 to 30 seconds for the next pump. After any of these um, nebulizers, inhalers, or anything like that, you really, you you advocate for that patient to rinse their mouth out, okay? By leaving the mouth it in the mouth, you can cause sores, thrush. It's, it's just a good habit for them to um, rinse their mouth out with water. Okay, dry powdered inhalers, do not refrigerate or store in a humid place, low dose if necessary. Seal lips around the um, mouthpiece. In this one, you breathe in rapidly and deeply. Um, hold for 10 seconds and then you exhale slowly. And actually, the it's a dry powder. It's in a little uh, pill form, like a capsule. And whenever you um, close the canister, that's when it releases that powder. Again, rinse the mouth after you. Okay. Um, there is con complementary therapies, elimination diets. Whatever would cause the asthma attack, you would eliminate it. Um, there's different diets for asthma, patients with asthma, patients with epilepsy, you know, they're coming up with new and newer and newer diets. Okay. Vitamin C, zinc, magnesium supplementation. That's another thing. If you remember looking at our, um, doing our pumps, whenever we're giving a mag as a rider, you know, giving them for electrolytes, you can give mag right to OB patients to stop their contractions. But we can also give MAG as asthma. And if you looked, whenever we're given MAG as, a, as an electrolyte, it is one mil, I'm trying to think, one gram per hour. But if you're giving it to a patient with asthma symptoms, if you remember, we're going to give it within 15 minutes. So we would be given two grams within 15 gr minutes. Um, we don't, I don't see that on the floor. I don't know how often they use it down in the ER. In fact, maybe I should ask the next time. But don't you think that's kind of interesting that, you know, we do it for over two hours for two grams. Meanwhile, you know, for exasperation of asthma, they will do it within 15 minutes. Okay. Um, Omega-3 supplements, seem, they seem to have good results. Uh, fish oil with um, asthma. Using herbal preparations must be use caution. Ephedra, they used to use ephedra. It's a stimulant. There used to be little capsules called ephedrine. Um, and it was like a over-the-counter speed, so to speak. And then back in, I would say, 2000s, like 2005, 
2006, people were taking that ephedrine. Oh my gosh, they were like taking 20 pills at a time. So guess what? And then those wonderful people called uh, those meth heads, they decided, oh, we can use meth. You know, we can get the use the ephedra for meth. So now it's outlawed and uh, you have to sign your life away, I guess, if you'd ever want it. But anyway, the ephedra really doesn't go well with asthma. Um, so we have to be careful what the patient's taking at home. The Ma Hong, that is a, it's an herbal, so it's not regulated by the FDA yet. Trust me, they'll get their hands on it though. Okay, then we have COPD. Okay, the problem with COPD versus asthma is with COPD, you can't get the air out. With, with the asthma, you can't get the air in, okay? But COPD is the third leading cause of death in the U.S. Morbidity is very significant, okay? 12.7 million diagnosed with millions more not yet diagnosed. And they don't, they probably, there's probably millions of people really walking around with COPD. Who are usually the COPDers? Those are the smokers. That's the leading cause. If I see a COPD patient, right, COPD, v, PVD, PAD, bladder cancer, you're looking at smokers, okay? That's my own research done in my head, so I don't know how well it is, but I I would say 99% of your COPDers are smokers, okay? And they will continue to smoke. They will only quit when they want to. Okay, other contributing factors, air pollution, occupational exposure, airway infection, asthma, familiar and geno genetic factors, and aging. You might catch a couple of COPDers that quit smoking maybe 10 years ago, um, and they have a case of COPD, but a lot of them are just active smokers. Okay, so what happens? Progressive obstruction of the airways cause narrow airways to narrow, resistance to airflow to increase and expiration to become slow or difficult. Um, resulting in mismatched ventilation and perfusion and impaired gas exchange. Periodic exasperations with increased symptoms of dyspnea and sputum production from which airways and parenchyma do not recover but progressively deteriorate. Okay, it consists of chronic bronchitis and emphysema. So basically, COPD is an, um, an umbrella term. Um, when you think of chronic bronchitis and emphysema, that's what we, we're talking about, COPD. Um, that's what COPD is, bronchitis, chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Okay, so what happens? So you're going to have a narrowing of the airways. Okay, and because of the narrowing of the airways, you're going to have a hard time expirating the air that comes in. So basically, the air gets trapped into the lungs and is unable to go out. Okay, what happens then? So you have this air coming in, no air coming out. Okay, it's getting trapped, so you're not being able to exchange the air. Okay, so you can't exchange the oxygen into the lungs and the carbon dioxide leave. Okay, it really impairs the air. So let's talk a little bit more about COPD ears. With COPD ears, because of the fact that the air is coming in, what does the body do? First of all, the body's going to use all its calories it can to help the person breathe. Also, what you're going to see is the patient's going to have a barrel chest, which means their chest is going to be bigger. Their ribs, um, it's just going to be a very large chest. And a lot of times when you're looking at end-stage COPD, their chest are large and their limbs, their arms, their legs are very thin, okay? And that is because of the fact that all that air is being trapped in, so the body's going to kind of like manipulate itself so that it can get more and more air in. Um, another thing is that whenever we're talking about COPD, is we generally do not go over two um, liters of oxygen. If they're unable to breathe, we try to stick to two. Now, there's sometimes we'll go up. And then we've had COPD years. Sorry. Um, for like five liters of oxygen. But we generally take, bring them 
and taper them down. It is not uncommon for a COPD or to be 88% oxygen. And sometimes you'll see orders, you know, titrate oxygen for to 89%. Okay. So anywhere from 88 to 92% we consider good for a COPD or. And yes, you'll need to know that. Blink, blink, wink, wink. Two liters is where we generally want blink, blink, wink, wink. Okay, now, these guys and what ladies have a hard time um, dealing with their problems with breathing. So you might see them sitting up on the side of their bed. They, It's not good enough for them to be up you know, in a high fowlers, they actually have to lean over their trays, um, their tables, the bedside tables, because of the fact that that's the only way they can breathe. Okay. Very hard disease to see people having such a hard time breathing. Um, and they might always be dyspneic. You know, it's, it gets to a point where just going to the bathroom and they'll be out of breath, even with oxygen. And really there's nothing else we can do for them. And sad to say, we try to control the symptoms as much as we can, but, you know, they do deteriorate. Okay, chronic bronchitis. Incidence increase among smokers usually follows upper respiratory infection caused by abnormal increase in mucus secretion. Um, cilia is impaired, unable to move secretions upward to be coughed out, causing mucus plug formation. Okay, they're going to have a persistent productive cough. Copious mucoperlent sputum. Yum. Um, symptoms of hy pulmonary hypertension and right-sided heart failure can happen. We Emphysema is characterized by destruction of walls of the alveoli with result enlargement of abnormal air spaces. This large enlargement results in pulmonary capillary bed and support tissue leading to loss of alveolar surface for gas exchange. So you're learn you're losing that surface that would do the gas change. Okay. That is very vital in the gas change. And when you lose that surface, that means your gas exchange is also impaired. Okay. okay. So you see the barrel chest his and his thin build, but then look at the x-ray. There's like nothing. Okay. It's a whole lot of nothing, isn't it? Actually, has a sm pretty small um, uh, heart compared to the rest of his chest, and that's what you expect with the COPD. -er. Uh, okay, diagnosed. We're going to do a uh, pulmonary function test. We're going to do serum alpha and trypsin levels, ABGs, CBCs, chest X-ray, and a six-minute walk test. Okay, so what I want you to know is that we will do the PFTs, ABCs, CBC, and chest X-ray. Okay, to diagnose it, we might you might see the alpha and tryptophan levels, but um, generally it's definitely if you come into the hospital and you're short of breath, we're going to be doing the ABG, ABG, CBC, and its chest X-ray first. Um, we'll follow that up with the PFT. The six-minute walk test is going to define if you need oxygen or not, and it really isn't six minutes. Basically, they walk you around the halls and see how you do when you walk. That is the only way you're going to get oxygen to go home with. You know, you can't be in the hospital and we sit there and say, oh, we think you need oxygen at home. Here, here's a tank. Have a great day. No. For insurance to pay for it, you need to do that six-minute walk and it has to be well documented by the uh, respiratory therapist. Okay. Medications. Anybody that has any kind of breathing issues, we're going to advocate for them to have the flu and pneumonia vaccine. Okay. We're going to do bronchodilators. We're going to do imitripium bromide, theophylin, dalaresp. We're also going to give them corticosteroids. And like I said, we're going to try not to do that every day. But if they have exasperations, we're going to give them the IV corticosteroids, like solimedrol. Um, but then when they go home, we're going to do it on, you know, we're going to give them a decreasing dose. Okay. So, so we're not going to just cut them off, but we're going to give them, um, some steroids just to get them over the hump till they start feeling better Then, then hopefully they won't need more steroids. Okay. Management, long-term oxygen therapy. 
We don't want to give them more oxygen than they need because it will deplete the hypoxic drive. Of course, we're going to say no smoking, especially if they're wearing oxygen. We're going to try to keep them away from irritants. So if there's a smoker in a home, we're going to ask them not to smoke. Pulmonary hygiene. Okay, we want them to be able to cough. Postural drainage, we don't want them laying in bed all day. We want them up so the drainage gets to the bottom of their lungs. Um, hydration, we want to make sure they have enough fluids so that, that they're able to cough up any um, mucus that's in their lungs. And we're going to do breathing exercise, pursed lip, lip and abdominal breathing. And, of course, we're going to do pulmonary rehab. And they will be doing pulmonary rehab while they're in the hospital. It's just like um, cardiac rehab. They will see those people in the at the hospital and hopefully get a nice relationship going so that they'll continue to go every day to pulmonary rehab. Um, management, minimal activity, even eating causes fatigue. Um, so what do you think? Well, I guess I don't have to tell you what to think um, because I probably have it in a slide. So increased workload, increased metabolic demands. Remember, everything they do is to breathe. Every calorie. So even eating, if they're coughing and not able to take a breath, it takes a lot out of them. I had a patient that was, she came in for a knee replacement and she was, ha and I was charged and every time she was on a non-rebreather, try to think, no, she was on a BiPAP and she was doing well on a BiPAP, but she was so hungry. All she wanted to do was eat. So they took her off the BiPAP, put her on a high flow nasal cannula. But what happened was every time she moved her arm to eat soup, she would desat. I mean, when I say desat, she would go from 93 down to like 83. I mean, that's how much it took. So I told her, I said, I'll feed you, you know, so you don't, so you can eat. Well, once you know that worked for so long until she started talking. And guess what? If you're going to desat because of the fact, um, because you can't lift your arm, guess what you're going to do whenever you talk? You desat. So I had to keep on telling her to be quiet, but that didn't work. But anyway, she did She did eat some, um, which made her a lot happier. They need ne frequent smaller meals, okay? High calorie. So we're going to do high carbs. Because they, that's, they need those calories to burn, okay? And we're going to give them supplements. Um, so small meals more often. Diminished quality of life requires emotional support for both family. It's, you know, it has, it has to be hell. Not being able to breathe and do the things that you want to. It has to be scary too. So just remember, what, how would you feel in their shoes? Okay, lung transplants. Um, perform with, when medical therapy is no longer effective. And quite honestly, I don't know if they do them for COPD ears. They might. But who, who's good for a lung transplant? Basically, anybody that needs a lung, I imagine. Of course, there's going to be people higher on the list than others. Um, much preparation and optimization of health is required. Some of the complications are rejection, infection, side effects of immunosuppressant therapy. Must do regular coughing and deep breathing. Exercise related to decreased cough stimuli of um, the lung tissue. So... Who's good for a lung transplant? Well, I guess anybody that needs a lung um, that's not smoking. They're not going to give a lung transplant to somebody that smokes. Okay. What else? Think of who would be if you had like four people. Who would not be good for a lung transplant? And I'm only telling you this because you might see it. Blink, blink. Wink, wink. And it has to do with the complications of a lung transplant. So just be aware. Okay. Cystic fibrosis, most common lethal genetic disease in Caucasians, affects about 30,000 U.S. student or children and adults. One in 31 carry the CF trait. Survival rate depending on severity of the disease. It was an interesting when I had William, I was a little bit on the older side, so they made me go to a genetic counselor to see what's the odds of him having a me having a baby that's Down syndrome. 
Um, so we went to St. Mary's and Clayton for the genetic test or the genetic counseling. And then they wanted to do a, uh, uh, what the heck do they call it when they take that big old needle and put it in your placenta or into your abdomen and draw amniocentesis. So we talked to the genetic counselor and what was interesting is my cousin has a daughter that has cystic fibrosis. They were more worried about her, me having a baby that was cystic fibrosis than they were about me having a, uh, Down syndrome baby. They said I have much, much more of a chance to have a cystic fibrosis baby, even though it was my cousin's child. I thought it was kind of, I mean, and that was the only child in my family that's had cystic fibrosis that I know of. But anyway, so there you go. It used to be like a death um, sentence for these, these kids. Um, by the time they were 18, maybe 1920, uh, the kids would pretty much uh, have been would die from this disease. Um, there was, there is still a, um, a, a organization called 65 roses. And it's because a lot of kids can't say cystic fibrosis. It make it sounds like 65 roses, um, that did a lot of research and they did a lot of great things. Okay. Okay. So what it is, autumn, some, Autosomal recessive disorder. It lacks the CFTR protein. You don't even have to know about the CFTR protein. Um, abnormal sodium and chloride transfer. Now that's going to be interesting later on. So what happens? It affects the respiratory, the GI, and the re reproductive tracts. Okay. Abnormal excrine um, glands. So with respiratory, it has excessive mucus... Um, production with impaired ability to clear secretions, progressive COPD, pulmonary hypertension, right ventricle hypertrophy, and core pulmonale. Okay, that's with the respiratory. With the GI, it doesn't have the pancreatic enzyme deficiency. Okay, so it doesn't have that pancreatic enzyme, so impaired decision. Um, there's an elevation of sodium and chloride in the sweat. Okay, now that's really important. Because what happens if you're hyponatremic? So these are probably going to be the only people you're ever going to tell them to eat a lot of salt. Okay? Especially in the summer. They're going to have, because what happens in the summer? You sweat. So they're going to have to increase their salt intake in the summer. Okay? Um, reproduction endocrine. Diabetes. They often have a diabetes. Liver failure. Males usually require assistive reproductive technology and the females have very difficult um, conceiving. So manifestations, um, COPD in early childhood, recurrent pneumonia, exercise intolerance, chronic cough, clubbing of fingers and toes, barrel chest, hyperresolent percussion, which is about the same thing. I mean, you read all this, this is the same thing with COPDers, right? It's like the signs and symptoms of COPDers. But you add abdominal pain, steatorrhea. What's steatorrhea? Anyone? 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 It's gas, or it's like greasy, stinky poo. Okay? And there's small stature. So diagnosis. We're going to look at their um, concentration in their sweat, the sodium in their sweat. We're going to do ABGs, and we're going to see if there's evidence of lung disease. Okay, pancreatic insufficiency. Immunization against respiratory tracts. We're going to give them hypertonic saline, inhalation, bronchodilators, pancreatic enzymes. They're going to have to um, take pills for their pancreas. Um, early antibiotic for respiratory illness. And the dwarf knees alpha breaks down excess DNA and sputum, making it less vicious and easier to clear. Treatment, percussion, postural drainage, special coughing and draining techniques, oxygen therapy, liberal fluid intake. So we want them to drink very um, lots of fluids, but they still have to take lots of salt, right? Because if you drink lots of water, what's going to happen? You're going to decrease your salt. 
So we're going to have to make sure that they are keeping an uptake in their salt. Okay, high calorie diet, supplements of vitamins and minerals, emotional support, and lung transplant is the only definitive treatment. And you know, Brandy, the speech there, or the speech instructor, she had, um, she has cystic fibrosis, and she went through a lung transplant. Um, I'm sure she's told I don't think it's a HIPAA thing. I guess if it is, oops. But anyway, I, I'm pretty sure she tells all of her classes. Um, but look at her stature, how small she is. Okay, and she did go through a lung transplant. Was it? Why do I want to say? several years ago but she still has to go back and get all kinds of blood tests and everything else to make sure that it's still doing well and I think this is my last slide so thank you very much for listening I hope you weren't too bored and write down any problems that you have with any of these slides okay make sure you uh, document it so when we get to class we can go through it okay thank you very much and have a great day